Welcome to The Heal Podcast. I'm Kelly Noonan Gores, and every week I speak to the leading doctors, healers, spiritual teachers, and scientists to find out what is truly possible when it comes to healing. I also interview real people with extraordinary healing stories. My philosophy is what's possible for one is possible for all. Let's talk about sex, baby. Let's talk about you and me. Pardon my karaoke moment, but that was a real famous song growing up and applicable to today's episode because I interview Jaya. She is an internationally recognized, award-winning sexologist and best-selling author. She wrote Red Hot Touch and Cuffed, Tied, and Satisfied. Jaya is the creator of the erotic blueprint quiz through more than two decades of client observation and clinical research she discovered a map of arousal that reveals your specific erotic language of turn on this revolutionary framework helps you create deeper connection and total sexual satisfaction you won't want to miss this episode because i get a little vulnerable i open up and share about my work with jaya And she gets into all the aspects of healing that pleasure brings. Without further ado, let's get to it. Let's get it on with Jaya. Welcome, Jaya. (laughs) That was juicy. (laughs) Thanks for having me. That was juicy. (laughs) Oh my gosh. I'm blushing already. Um, So thank you so much for coming on. There's so much to explore in the world of intimacy and sex and pleasure and um if you're watching this and not just listening on the podcast, uh, you'll see that I'm 16 shades of red because, um, you know, I was raised Catholic, both of my sets of grandparents were Catholic. So sex just has this like taboo attached to it. It's just got this stigma, um, of shame and guilt for, you know, just culturally or religious, um, Lee or whatever. So, uh, I'm so excited because I'm working with you, And, um, I want to break through that. I want to heal that kind of association and just be free with these wonderful pleasure instruments that we have called our bodies. So can't wait to dive in. Um, talk to me a little about your background and how you started to do the work that you do. Absolutely. Um, well, I will also say that I'm in the Catholic, like grew up Catholic, grew up with all the shame around sexuality. I remember being really young and like praying to God, like, oh God, I'll stop touching myself when I'm seven. (laughs) I turned seven. I'd be like, oh God, I promise I'll stop when I'm 14. Like, I, I don't know how I got that it was bad. You know, like the messaging that touching my body or like feeling pleasure because early in my life, it was like, it was a prayer. It was like this, like God gave me this instrument to to touch and to be in pleasure with. And so, but somehow that we all get that messaging, you know, close your legs, sit this way, be good, be a good girl. You know, we, we just get those messages growing up that somehow our body isn't okay. That somehow pleasure isn't okay. That somehow sexuality is, is something we should be ashamed of, or the desire for pleasure is something we should be ashamed of. And I think that also ties into rest in our culture and play in our culture. We work, we work, we work, we work, we work. And we forget that rest and play are really valuable. They've actually become a shadow. It's like pleasure, play, rest has become this shadow. And so I was really young when I saw Dr. Ruth. I don't know if any of your listeners know Dr. Ruth, but she's still alive and just was a pioneer. And somewhere, somehow I saw her and I I thought to myself, I mean, I must've been like 10 or 11. And I thought to myself, that's what I want to do with my life. I want to help people be in pleasure, help people learn about sexuality. I blossomed young too. So like, I'd already got my period. Like I I read the books about where babies came from. Like, and, and I was excited about the idea of like helping people make babies from a very young age. Like, how can I help people make babies? And then as I learned more about sexuality, it was like, oh my gosh, this is just like a whole world where there's 
there's so much that can be provided from education about consent to our bodies, to how to touch, to pleasure, to our own uh, psycho-spiritual aspects. And so when I was 19, I got involved in tantric sex. And this was the first place where I saw like spirituality and sexuality bridge. And that sex was this sacred thing, not something to be ashamed of. And that was really a turning point. I was around 19 when that happened. And and that was, that was, that was it. That was like, oh my gosh, I just found the thing that I had my sexual awakening at 19 years old. Wow. It's amazing. Um, so it's just so great. So talk to me about the erotic blueprint. Cause it's, it reminds me of the five love languages, um, which are sweet. And, uh, you've kind of discovered what that people have kind of these erotic languages as well. Tell mm-hmm. us about those. So the erotic blueprints are a way of understanding your sexuality and how you're wired and that there's nothing wrong or broken about you. I think it's the number one question I get is, am I normal? Is something wrong with me? Am I broken? And I really want to break down that mythology that there's anything wrong or that you're broken or that you're abnormal or that your genitals are abnormal because they look differently than how you've seen or or things are different than we've seen in media. That's one place that I think the erotic blueprints give us a language for who we are as erotic beings and then can take us further into peeling back like who am I really without the conditioning and the programming. And then for couples to give us a language for, well, who are you and how do I touch you and how do I please you and how do I initiate sex? So that was the, the foundation of what I was looking for. And part of that came out of my own relationship. Like my partner and I felt like we were on different pages. I kept, you know, I was like taking striptease class and like dancing for him in, in my G-string. He's just like, why are you doing that? It's so obvious. <laughs> and like I'd initiate sex and he just, he, he, he wasn't like getting aroused or getting into sex with me. Part of it was we had a new baby. You know, there were a lot of things going on in our lives, but part of it was we were just on different pages. I didn't know how to address his eroticism. When I'd written all the books on the techniques, you know, I had the oral sex book and Red Hot Touch and, you know, I'd written these books with hundreds of techniques and my partner's not interested in them. And so there was that aspect and then there was the work with my clients. And so I started noticing patterns in people and that's where the erotic blueprints were, were born is in these noticings. Should I go through all five of them? Just I so would love you to, yeah. Okay, yeah great. So the first one is energetic and the energetic is someone who's turned on by anticipation, space, tease, longing, yearning. I don't know if you've ever like <laughs> raise hand raise <laughs> me too um you know you've ever been like like the beginnings of something and you're about to kiss and there's all that electricity and all that like Wah! feeling in the body and then you kiss and it's kind of like it, it's less when you go physical than when you're in the anticipation so that a lot of that's the energetic Someone who's energetic has superpowers of they can have an orgasm without being touched. Like I've seen people 30 feet away, you know, or we're just like sending energy to someone and and they're writhing and just sheer ecstasy and orgasm. So there is, there is this hypersensitivity of their nervous system where they can like reach, you can reach them from further away. So the shadow side of the energetic can be hierarchical thinking. You might hear them say something like, oh, you're in your base chakras or, you know, oh, you, you know, I used to be like, you eat meat or watch television. You know, I used to have this like <laughs> judgy, judgy way about me because I'm more spiritual or whatever, you know, the, those kinds of thoughts would come up as part of the shadow aspect of the energetic that, oh, base sexuality is not okay. Only this sort of enlightened way of being is the right way of being. And then the other shadow is they short circuit really quickly. So if someone goes to your clitoris too quick, too fast, and is like, just rubbing away, you you just go numb. So there can be a numb or a dissociation that happens in the the energetic blueprint. I see you nodding your head. (laughs) (laughs) It's overwhelming. You just shut down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So the next one's sensual and the sensual is someone who is ignited by all of their senses. So it's taste, it's touch, it's smell, it's, it's the beauty of the environment that you're in. That is the turn on. Um, superpowers are, they can have non-genital orgasm. So like somebody could be giving you a really deep, lovely massage and you'll go into an orgasmic experience or eating chocolate. There was this one experience I had where someone put chocolate in my mouth. We've been going for three or four hours and they put a piece of chocolate in my mouth and I was blindfolded. And I, I just started weeping because it was, 
like the orgasmic experience of that chocolate was just mm. so exquisite. So that's a sensual experience of orgasm and can be a superpower. They also bring beauty to the erotic experience. They're going to put the flowers and the candles and the music and the slow dancing, the romance to all of it. The mm. context of emotionality is really important to the sensual shadow side stuck in your head. You know, you're thinking about the dishes that didn't get done or like the five things at work or the person you forgot to call, like all of those things start to come up instead of the pleasure that's happening in your body or, or you might be worried about body image, like, oh, you know, my smell okay, or your partner's breath doesn't smell right. Like all those things start to distract you from the experience. That's mm. the shadow of the sensual. The next is the sexual. Sexual is turned on by what we think of as sex in our culture. Our culture has kind of like, this is what sex is. And it has a limited definition in its shadow aspect. But the sexual is someone who can go from zero to 60 really quickly. Sex um, is simple. It does not lack depth. It's just simple. It's like, you know, pizza. Pizza is good. Put cheese on dough. <laughs> you can't go wrong with it. You know? It's like, what? Everybody's having an orgasm. I have an erection. You know, this person's wet. Like, that all is just like part of what sex is defined as and what means it's successful. The superpower is that they're usually very orgasmic, usually have a higher libido. Sex is something that they use to relax. So it's like, oh, I had sex. Everything is good in the world. Whereas a sensual needs to relax first in order to have sex. So it's like almost opposites there. And like, whereas an energetic needs all this space, a sexual is like wanting to go right for it. Also sensual collapses space as well. So it's interesting to see, you know, how these different blueprints interact with each other. On the shadow side of the sexual, it's this limited definition of sex. It's like, we've defined it as orgasm penetration, usually a heteronormative frame. So there's this framework of what sex is and what is successful sex that's limiting. And then they think everybody else is wrong. So this is where we sometimes get the feeling that we're broken because we live in the sexual culture of like, oh, you have sex and you have orgasm by me not touching you, something's weird. You know, or you need all this foreplay, something's wrong with you. Mm. And so that's where we start to get that it, something's wrong is because we have this limited definition of what sex and orgasm looks like. And we really haven't explored outside that box as a culture. We haven't done that. And so sexuals can feel like they're in the right, like we're having orgasms. What's wrong with our sex life? Why would you want anything else different? Yeah. Got it. All right, two more. So there's the kinky next. And kinky is someone who's turned on by the taboo. Two different types of kinky. There's the taboo of impact. So things like spanking or choking, like those kinds of aspects of the kinky play. And then there's the psychological, which is more like power dynamic. So this would be like playing a game of... I have power over you, you're surrendering power to me or vice versa yeah. some people. And some people do both. Some people like to switch. So I'll go back to the story about my partner and I. So I am primary, when we take the test, the quiz, and I'm sure everybody, you can give everybody a link to the quiz. Um, when I took the quiz, I was mostly sexual and right underneath it was energetic. So I'm a sexual energetic. This was a while ago when my partner and I were having all this struggle. So I'm sexual energetic. And then he takes the test and he is a kinky sensual. I was zero kinky and he was zero sexual. So you can see the problem there. Like I didn't even know how to speak his language and he didn't know how to, I'm speaking like, let's have sex tonight. And he wants all this mystery. He doesn't want things to be obvious. He wants all this like luxury of time and space and setup. And I'm like, we have a new baby. We have five minutes. Come on. <laughs> you know. <laughs> and it wasn't working for either one of us. And so I found out that he was kinky psychological. And so all I started to do was like get some rope and lay it out on the bed. And then I was like seeing arousal out of him that I'd never seen before. And then all of a sudden we were really deeply connecting because I could, I learned how to speak his language. I spent like 40 days just every day learning something in his blueprint so that I could speak his language and find also like what in this blueprint turned me on so that I could expand more into his territory and into his language. 
sexual compatibility is a myth in my world. I really do feel that these are just languages. And it's just like if somebody speaks Spanish and you fall in love with them, you're going to learn to speak Spanish. If you're French and you fall in love with someone who speaks Chinese, you're going to learn how to speak Chinese. Like that's what we do when we fall in love with each other. And yet in our culture, we don't have the space for actually learning or admitting like, hey, I don't know how to turn someone on who's in an energetic body. There's nothing wrong with them. It's just, we just haven't learned. So on the kinky side, um, superpowers are, um, we have this ability to have orgasm similar to an energetic in these spaces of power and play and going into altered states of consciousness also endless creativity. I feel like I could learn about kink for the rest of my life and never have learned everything that there is to learn in this blueprint because there's so much variety. And it's that, it's that thing that's taboo for you. So, you know, we think about, I think instantly when we think about kink, we need to redefine it because we think about like these extremes that we've seen in media, as opposed to like, I worked with a couple who had sex in missionary position because they had religious background and that's what they told were told is the only position that they can have sex in. And then as they started to unravel that, they did it every for 40 years, same position, never changed it. And so they had kinky blueprint because everything was like, Oh my God, I can't believe we're doing this. You know, like it was all very, very taboo for them to just move out of that one position. So shadow side of the kink is shame. And that is, it's the deep shame of, is something wrong with me that I like these things that are edgy and taboo? Is it something, you know, like we start to question ourselves, like, why am I turned on by this? And then we hide. And then that shame can then turn into kind of a neuroses of, I need, that's the thing that turns me on. That's the only thing that's going to turn me on. And I need that thing to turn me on. And we lose variety in our, our choice of what turns us on. Mm. And so that can become this, uh, pathway, you know, we find a pathway that turns us on. I think we do this anyway, you know, any blueprint, we find that pathway that turns us on that creates this kind of groove that eventually becomes a rut that becomes this grave because it, because it becomes our only pathway to turn on. So speaking on that, the shapeshifter is the next one. And the shapeshifter is someone who's turned on by all of it. <laughs> it's like, they speak all the languages. They speak French and Chinese and German and, you know, like, like, they speak multiple languages. So they're amazing lovers. And that's the, the piece about them that's so amazing is that they can shapeshift to please anyone. And in their shadow, because they've been doing that, they're often starving. Like they're not being fully fed in all the blueprints. Mm -hmm. They'll find like a partner who's sensual and then they'll only speak sensual. And then there's all these parts of themselves that are getting cut off that aren't being fed. They've often been told they're too much. You're too much. Why do you want all this? You're too complicated. And it's not that they're complicated. It's just that they're erotically sophisticated. They have a high erotic IQ. And on their shadow side, they're always shape-shifting to please others. They become like the ultimate pleaser. Um, and then sometimes they can have the shadows of all the blueprints. Like they've got all the shadows. They get all the superpowers, but they'll sometimes get all the shadows as well. Whew. So those are the five. And that's what I love about it is learnable, right? It's yeah. like anything in our sexuality is, is learnable. I truly believe that we can expand into these different territories. And so a couple of things in there, you, you mentioned men, like mostly being sexual. What was really fascinating is we've had, I think it's close to half a million people now take that quiz. And we've been tracking, you know, because we gender relationship type, like all of these things. And what we found out is men were not all sex. It was not the highest blueprint for them. Wow. So that was really surprising, you know, because a lot of times it's taught like women are sensual. So buy her flowers and do the romantic things and men are sexual. So, you know, give him the oral sex to not, like every night. Like, but we actually saw that it wasn't, that wasn't true. And so that was really fascinating and just seeing, and it also could be that sexuals aren't gravitating toward our quiz, you know? So I always want to give that little caveat because they're, they may be the least likely to fill them out just because of the way that that blueprinting is. Right. Yeah. yeah. That, that actually makes so much sense. They're like, well, why do I need to take this quiz? I like sex. Sex is, comes easy right. to me. It's sex is great. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. um, that makes total sense. So, um, you, we started working together, you know, from a referral to a friend. And I realized that I had a lot of actual like physical healing to do. And so many people in society 
and this is not my experience, thank God, but so many people have some sort of sexual trauma in their history. Um, you know, I think our audience would really appreciate going into the healing work that you've done or that you see, or, you know, we did so much healing work physically, emotionally, energetically, um, talk a little bit about kind of the healing work that you've seen or some trends that you've seen, because I don't think people talk about sexual healing enough. And it's what you and I discovered was that there was so much trauma and painful memory in my tissues. And we literally had to go and unwind that and like release these memories and reframe. So it's, it's really powerful. The work you do, it's not just about pleasure and oh, it's, yeah. it's like, you're really helping people with profound healing so that they can open up to pleasure. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, so much to say here. So one thing is once you have those five blueprints, there's, there are four things to do with that. One is to heal the shadow aspects of the blueprint. One is to feed the blueprint. One is to speak the blueprint, which is body language, as well as like verbal words that you're using. And the last one is to expand the blueprint. And so this feed, speak, heal the blueprint. When we look at just the healing aspect, I'm always looking at four things. One, what's happening in the emotional realm. And so in in these instances, a lot of times people have some kind of historical artifact that is holding them back from their freedom erotically. If that's shame from upbringing, if that's the early messages about our bodies, if that's an actual physical you know, trauma that someone has had from early sexual experience. One of the things I thought was really interesting with women, one of my favorite books is called Dilemmas of Desire. And that the majority of women out of all the women that they went through, these were high school girls who were initially having sex sex just happened. It wasn't something, there were only two girls that actually took sexuality in their own hands. Like I was one of those girls. I was like, I want to go to the gynecologist. Like I want to have my first sexual experience. Like, let me learn everything that I can. Like I was one of those rare two. And for the majority of women or people who identify as women, this is not the case. Sex is something that happened. Or that. you just want to get over the first time, get it over with and get and it over be, with be sober while it happens. <laughs> right. Or get drunk. Right. Yeah. Get Like that was the case, like get drunk or I was somewhat coerced into it. Like it wasn't fully like something that I wanted or I wasn't really ready. So that in and of itself mm. right there is in the emotional realm can be something that we want to clear from the system. And it's not just in our mind. It's in our it's like you said, it's in our tissue. Mm -hmm. And so releasing that from the tissue, I've created this body work modality of listening to the body and going really slowly and feeling, is it in the emotion, even though I'm on the physical body, is it in the actual emotional realm? And it's the emotion that we need to integrate that has charge still that's holding us. So it's like a stuck charge and it gets stuck in time. And so often when it's stuck in time, we have four elements, images. I'm sure anybody listening to this can think of something that happened in their past historically around their sexuality. And there's an image that could be there that's stuck and it's kind of frozen or it's an emotion. I was afraid or I froze or there's some kind of emotion that the nervous system, you know, I I, I was really angry, but I couldn't do anything because it was unsafe to have my anger in that moment. So emotion, there's thoughts. What were you thinking at the time? What was the thought that's looping and it's still stuck there? And lastly, the body sensation. So once we can help those four elements unstick, then we can help that then integrate and move your body into present time instead of being stuck in the event that happened in the past. And so that's really what we're, we're working with on that level. And so we go from the physical body. So four elements, we got the physical body, we've got the emotional body, we've got the chemical body, what's happening with the hormones and the biochemistry in the body, which can be affected through the tissue. And then finally, what's happening energetically? And can we help that to integrate? And so sometimes when we're going energetically, we're going into, into realms like archetypes. Like I'll have my hands on some people's bodies and they'll go into, you know, I see this a lot with women persecution. 
um, where we're back into like, I can't be a sexual free person because I'm going to get person. I'm going to get called a slut. I'm going to get like, that could be here from when you were young. Right. Or the church is the inquisition is going to come after me. You know, sometimes it goes into those archetypal types of energies. And then we're working a little differently in the, in the archetypal realm, even though I have my hands on a, on a person's body. And this could just come from like a touch on a shoulder and then we're off into releasing these artifacts mm-hmm. that are there. Yeah. It's wild. And I, I was kind of laughing because I'm uh, uncomfortable again, because of that shame associated with sex and even having sex for the first time and not being sober. And just, it's so sad that so many of us, our first sexual experience is either that where we consciously choose to be unconscious <laughs> because there's so much fear and shame around it, or someone has taken advantage of us and there was no choice. Um, so there's so much trauma uh, to be, I mean, for me, I just would love to just how just that blanket subconscious belief that connects sex with dirty, shameful, taboo, God is watching, God is judging. I mean, I don't even know where that belief came from. I am assuming, uh, stories that I heard as a child, but Mm -hmm. what do you do to help people disconnect just the, the judgment of shame and the connection Mm -hmm. of shame and, and sex? The first piece is finding where is the shame living in your body and start to identify just like right now. I mean, any, anybody who's listening right now, we can go, okay, where's that charge of shame? And what does it feel like in the body? Does your breath hold? Do you tense your thighs? Like what starts to happen? You know, as I even talk about it, I can just feel like a little bit in my throat, you know, like mm-hmm. where is there any shame? from early messaging and where is it living in your body and then give it some qualities like is it what color is it does it feel like it's tight does it feel like it's big is it small how old does it feel and as you just start to give it some qualities just get in touch with it and then listen to it and then the first thing you can do is just ask it what what do you what are you here for what do you want why is this shame existing? What do you want? And oftentimes the shame is existing because it wants to protect you. It's often a protector part or it wants to keep you in line. <laughs> like I hear that a lot, you know? And so this could just be a simple exercise, just like what we just did, just going in. And I think a lot of people don't want to go in when it comes to sex. It's scary to go in. So sometimes we just have to work with the part that's so scared just to be in the body and then work with the parts that are so scared to like actually look at sexuality. Like those, sometimes that's a very, very first step is just, let's just be gentle. I think we try, we beat ourselves up like, Oh, I'm in shame. And that's okay. Let's be okay with the place that you're at. Like, It's okay that you have shame. Of course you have shame. Look at the culture. Look at what happens around gender, you know, with our bodies, those of us who identify as cisgendered, heterosexual women, um, or, you know, what happens if we go outside that box? Look at what has happened historically. Of course we have shame. There's messages every day that our bodies aren't okay that, you know, we need to shift, we need to keep our legs closed, like, of course. So it's just compassion for those parts and then moving into loving them and listening to them. And then there's ways to actually integrate those parts, similarly to those four elements when I was talking about duplicating them when we were on the body, we can, we can integrate those parts and then we have more freedom and more choice. And we're acting from a more healthful place where we can stay conscious during sex. And then, you know, and there's, there's places beyond this. Like I see sexuality as a tool to our awakening. It's it's a very deep journey when you decide to go on this journey. I think that's why I actually decided to take the leap and work with you one-on-one because you said that sexuality is the final frontier of what, tell me what you said again. It was so profound. Yeah. Sexuality for many people is the final frontier of personal growth because it is the scariest 
rock to look under. You know, it's like, oh, I can look under the health rock and start, you know, eating differently or doing juicing or you know, those things. That seems a little, and, you know, I can look under this rock of business and entrepreneurship or, or being like a better human. But when people come to me, they often say, oh, this was the scariest one. Mm-hmm. This was the one that I just, uh, I, I, I couldn't look at. And that's why I think it's such a powerful tool for awakening is because we have the deepest shadow here in sexuality. And so when we can go into those parts of ourselves that are scary and feel like it's the darker aspects, we then start to uncover who we really are at a deep, deep level. And that truth, you know, it's, it's like a truth seeking serum and, And so I've always seen sexuality as a really powerful tool for the truth and digging into the truth of who we are. Enlightenment in the place we least likely think to look. We used to say that in all of our Tantra workshops, you know, (laughs) put it in the place we'd least likely look in the pelvic floor somewhere. (laughs) (laughs) Totally. The key is in your pelvic floor. Yes. Uh, (laughs) But it's so true because, you know, personal growth, self-realization, consciousness, freedom, you know, it's all about being free and authentic and fully expressed. Right. And what you and I discovered is that even just in sec- like, I just need to use my voice. I need to mm-hmm. learn how to communicate. Like there's so much that I'm not free when it comes to intimacy and sex based on cultural stuff and shame and, and judgment and ideas that I've adopted along the way. And, um, so it's, it, it, it is unlikely, but it's so true. It's such a parallel, the bedroom or not the bedroom, if you want to go kink, uh, is, 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 is access to, is that last piece of full freedom, mm-hmm. you know, full authenticity, authentic expression. So, yeah. <gasps> I've got a lot of work to do. So much <laughs> your, your transparency, you know, you're being so vulnerable and, and all of this. So thank you because these conversations are the ones I feel like we need to have Yeah, and we need you. to start talking about it. And that's one of the challenges. We don't have community around sexuality. We don't have communication around sexuality and these conversations. I think it's just really important to start having these kinds of authentic human connections of look, here's where I am. And like, we really don't know, you know, we there's so much that we don't know. And it's, it's so nice to just be with another human being and in this space of, Hey, you know, what's up with sex? Let, let's just talk about this let's thing. Talk about <laughs> sex. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it takes, you know, um, I'm willing to be vulnerable because then other people can go, Oh, I don't have it all figured out too. And mm-hmm. especially like in that first, you know, full day that we work together, for me to become aware of just how much pain I was holding in my body based on painful experiences in the past and, ha- and to realize like how subconsciously that's holding me back from pleasure, from relaxation, from, it's just a low grade wear and tear on my energetic, physical, and emotional body. Mm-hmm. And so just for people to wake up to that, so they can seek certain healing and um, and to know how, how many, how much sexual trauma is in our society and, and that it's such a necessary part of people's healing, you know, um, and that there's people and places they can go that can really offer that and, and help to heal like you. So thank, thank you. you for doing the work you do, Absolutely, <laughs> oh, man. Um, so yeah, tell us a couple more stories where, you know, you have like of healing, you know, or just share one of healings, just that someone might resonate and go, Oh my gosh, I can, Mm -hmm. I can reintegrate and and then access pleasure and joy and and life again, um, after trauma or whatever. Yeah. So one that I think we don't talk about a lot is childbirth, women giving birth, and the trauma that can occur within the system, you know, of that from vaginal tears to scar tissue, to having a long labor and then not knowing in the postpartum period, you know, all of a sudden you've got like a baby and your body's all different and ah, there's breast milk and vomit and blah. You know, I joke, I went from a sex goddess to like a freaked out mom overnight, (laughs) you know, it was just, so 
I feel like this is an area where in, in other cultures, there's this lying in period where you get to like heal and there's herbs and there's healing and there's massage and there's all of this that happens after you've given birth. And so I ha I've had many, we did a research project, a woman named Ellen Heed and I did a research project where we worked with women postpartum because I was, after the birth of my son, I was torn apart. Literally, I had an L-shaped tear. So this went through my vaginal canal and this went down to my anus. Oh my and I thought I'd never have sex again. I was like, I grew keloidal scars, you know, those big purple ones. It was just, oh, it was gnarly. And so uh, I set out on a healing journey myself to heal those scars. And I didn't know there was such a thing as scar tissue massage and that, you, that it was actually very simple. It was three sessions and I was back to my vaginal tissue being resilient and healthy and pink. Wow. And so we worked with women who had um, hysterectomy. We worked with women who had had various just surgeries all through the ovaries removed or pregnant you know, C-sections difficult childbirth, cervical tears, you know, like all these kinds of things. And it was just really miraculous to see how scar tissue, one was affecting them pain wise. And we had one woman whose cervix was adhered completely. So the cervix sits into the vaginal canal and it can move. So during arousal, the cervix moves out so that up and out it tilts, we called it uterine flight. And it tilts so that, you know, when somebody's penis is coming in, it's not banging up against <laughs> the cervix the whole time. But hers was adhered completely into her vaginal canal. And so it couldn't move. And so sex was incredibly painful. And then I remember talking to her like two and a half years later, and she's like, I'm still like, I still have the most amazing sex two years after getting the scar tissue massage. So these kinds of things uh, that like, like it's, a simple fix, but there wasn't the conversation. And we had stories of like, doctors are giving me numbing cream to put on my clitoris. <laughs> it's like, no, the point of the clitoris is pleasure. To feel. <laughs> <laughs> to feel, like, why would you want to have sex if you can't feel anything? So just that's more in the physical realm, right? And then there's a lot, I have lots of stories of healing shame. I mean, that's probably the biggest thing is the sexual freedom of who am I as an erotic being really without the conditioning of parents or porn or family or, you know, religion or what culture is telling me I should be as a sexual being versus who am I? And oh my gosh, who I am is like that moment of love for self. And so having people move, I had a suicidal client and having them move from suicidal to, you know, I can't do this and I can't do life to, I love myself. I have unconditional love for myself and watching that transformation. I and mean, there's nothing more rewarding than having that piece. I think that's what this life game is about is learning unconditional love for me from me. Mm -hmm. And when you get that, everybody is bathed in unconditional love. Everybody gets it. Exactly. And that's what I'm thinking here now. It's like, even say your partner is um, kinky and you are not. And so, you know, inevitably there's going to be some judgment there of, oh God, like something is wrong with them for them to be turned on by goats or whatever they're, they're uh -huh. you know, <laughs> um, so it's, it's, but once you have full embrace and love for yourself and understand, like, then you can fully embrace and have compassion and love for them without judgment. Right. So do you have through all this work and because you're so sexually free, I mean, is, does shame show up at all for you anymore? Shame will show up, but I still love myself in my shame. So that's the difference, right? It used to be shame would show up and I would judge myself for being in shame. As opposed to now I'm in deep acceptance of anything that arises. And so, and then the difference too is that I can unconditionally love another, an, you know, another apparent person, but I now know that unconditional love doesn't mean without boundaries. And I think that that's a really important distinction because I think a lot of us think, oh, if I'm in unconditional love, that means that I 
don't have boundaries. No, there's still discernment and there's still, I love you unconditionally, but I'm not going to hang out with you because it would be unhealthy because I love me. I get to be included in that unconditional love. So as shame arises, I go, oh, there's that, that thing called shame. Cause I just said that thing, or maybe I shouldn't have done that. Or, you know, like those thoughts still arise, but there's a, oh, and I love, I love me in that. And then it goes, and then it, it disintegrates because there's nothing it can hook onto. Yes. But if I start to go, I'm in shame and oh, Jaya, here you are in shame. You're, you're the sexologist. You're not supposed to have shame or any of those things. Then it's got me. Mm-hmm. But for the most part, it rises and I go, there's that, there's that thing called shame. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I love that. That's so good. And it's, it is, there's something we're never taught how to process emotion. We're never taught how to be okay with these feelings that come up. Um, and are, you know, if it's painful or uncomfortable or dark or shadowy or whatever, you know, we resist it and, and push it away or suppress it or repress it. And mm-hmm. because we just can't deal with the discomfort or the pain of it. Um, and that's where addiction can come out of, right? Mm-hmm. It's like, I'm trying to repress. I, cause I don't know how to feel or process pain, or I don't know how to feel or process these desires that are coming up. So I'll use something to suppress it. And I, and I want to go again, like addiction ha- has a, even a purpose. It's help. It's helping you in some way, not that it's a healthful way for most people, but it's now maybe the question is how can I be with my pain? How can I be with this history that happened? How can I go inward and be with it and sit with it and go hi? One of my favorite Buddha stories is, when the Buddha Mara comes and Mara is bringing all the demons and all of the desires and all of those things. And she's there like trying to tempt Buddha and Buddha says, come and have a cup of tea. He invites Mara in and says, have a cup of tea. And to me, that's when we can go in and go, okay, shame. Okay. Pain. Let's, let's sit and have a cup of tea together. Yeah. What message are you bringing me? (laughs) <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, so just because we're on the topic of sex um, and addiction, porn, how does porn play? If someone is addicted to porn or what is that telling you about this person? Is it bad? Is porn bad? What is, what is your opinion of porn? So just like any tool, porn is a tool and it can be used negatively. It can be used positively. So the question comes to how are you utilizing it? How are you using it? And then what is the effect of the use on your life and on your lifestyle? I have no judgment of people using porn. It's more of what is it that it's bringing you and and how is it affecting? So there have been studies that show that porn can affect the ability because you're starting to get into somatic wiring. I talked about the rut, the grave, you get into somatic wiring of seeing a certain body type, seeing a certain angle, the way that you're touching your body. And then if you're doing that over and over and over again on a daily basis and you have a compulsion for it, like it's something that you need to do in order to relax. Like I talked about earlier with this, again, nothing wrong with it. It's just, how can we look at that and go, wait a minute, are you not connecting with your partner? Cause I have some people who like, they watch porn and then they go to have sex with their partner and they can't get an erection because their partner doesn't look that way because the angles are, because the touch doesn't, because they've created a grave. Mm. And so we have to somatically unwire that habit or that pattern or that compulsion. And we have to look at, well, what is it about porn? What is the porn giving you that you're actually seeking? What's the seeking underneath that? Now, I also have couples who use porn to get aroused. Like they'll watch like um, feminist porn or they'll watch, like I have some favorites, you know, that I'll recommend to people because they, they like that as a way of getting aroused and they're using it as a tool for more connection. Mm. Or some people who are doing, there's like something now called porn yoga that one of my mentors created, which is staying conscious during it. It's like... <laughs> It's like being conscious, you're doing breath work, you're doing like erotic touch, you're staying in your body. 
you're not going out of your body in order to have this experience that's unconscious and an unconscious compulsion or unconscious habit or pattern. So my thing with porn is get conscious. How are you using the tool? Why are you using the tool? And what is it that is going to bring you an optimal experience and a conscious experience that leads again to further awakening of who you are as an erotic being? Yes, exactly. I, I would ex exactly. The only thing that's coming up is if you get into that groove and you're desensitizing or not connecting because of porn, because it's easier to just to do your own thing and you mm -hmm. know so much about isolation now and leading to disease. And so if if porn is a crutch to disconnect or not connect as much with others, that's something to become conscious of. But yes, that's it's, to awaken to and then go. Okay, well, what is it that it's bringing me? What is it giving me? There's a, a book called Existential Kink that I also really love. And um, it's always anything that's like showing up in your life. You go, what is this giving me? Like, what's my kink around it? What's the thing that this is giving me that I keep coming back to it over and over and over again? Because it's showing up in my life. So why am I coming back to it over and over again? Oh, it's giving me X, Y, Z. It's like make a list of all the things you're, it's giving you. And then go, is there a, health, a healthier way that I could be getting these same things? And then we can also integrate any charge. We can integrate those things that are keeping us stuck in that loop of the compulsion. If it's, if it's creating a disconnect. So interesting. Would that apply to like, if there's someone in your life that is uh, constantly challenging you or, or say, or maybe it's a, a type of relationship that you keep continue getting into, like, yes, maybe yes. may, may not be the healthiest for you or they're abusive or they're, you know, narcissistic or whatever. It's so that's that, what is this kink around these certain people? Yeah. Right? What am I getting out of this? What am I getting out of this? Why do I keep oh, calling God. this into my life? Mm -hmm. Interesting. I love Cause that. maybe there's something that you really love, you know, like, like I talk about the persecution piece, right. And the, the fear that some of us have around persecution. I'm like, what is my kink around this thing? Cause it keeps showing up in my life of like a charge or a piece that like, I won't go speak or I won't go do something because of this fear that will come up. Well, what's my kink around it? And so there must be something that I love. There must be something I like that I'm getting out of that piece. So good. So good. So um, let's talk about just even just pleasure as, as a healing modality, um, you know, because I feel like so many people, especially if they've been kind of suppressed through religion or and this is not any judgment on religion. It just happens to be a byproduct often of dogma um, that there's certain rules around sex and certain rigidity. Um, you know, how, how have you seen just mere pleasure be mm. healing and transformation for people? Because mm -hmm. a lot of us are not, like you said, even making time for play or pleasure in our life because we're so busy accomplishing, you know, and, and pleasure and play are, is where we're most creative oftentimes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this idea of pleasure as health, pleasure as healing. Uh, we have a saying in our brand culture, which is pleasure first. Before we do anything, we have pleasure first. Like before I even got on this interview, I like went and sat in my sauna and got like super warm. It was just like doing a little bit of like touch on my body and breath work because pleasure first. So before I do anything work related, I'm going to have a little bit of pleasure before I do that. So <laughs> that's one principle. And the reason being is now I'm resourced and radiant. Right. If I come to this, if I come to my work depleted, if I come unresourced, if I come not fed, then it's it, me. Pleasure is like fuel for our manifestation fire. It's fuel for our health. And so if you look at sex hormones, sex hormones are our health hormones. So the more that we get in touch with the, the juicy estrogens and the, the oxytocin in our bodies, the more radiance, the more we exude this from the inside out. And our bodies also, if we keep our bodies in pleasure, our bodies stay, think it's useful. They think like procreation, like it makes sense, right? We're still making babies. So if we're still making babies, let's keep producing some of these yummy hormones. Whereas if you're not living your life in that place of pleasure, those hormones may want, you know, it could be a cycle where the hormones are low. So then you don't feel like you're being in pleasure 
or, you know, you stop being in pleasure and then the hormones stop. So I have a whole thing around really staying very juicy, juicy, vital and alive through the act of pleasure. And then each blueprint kind of has its little health link. So like for an energetic, just psycho spiritually, energetics sometimes do not like being in a body. You know, we're all like, let's go out of our body. I don't know if you know any people like this who are like, why am I here in a human body? I don't want to be in a body. (laughs) Sex is like the thing where you're like, yeah, I like being in a body. This feels good. Like pleasure, pleasure reminds us of why we're here having this human experience. Mm. Pleasure resources us. Pleasure has this link, I think, to something bigger than ourselves. So sometimes pleasure can take us out of our body. Even if you get into really like energetic, not, you know, we can start to have like oneness experiences and orgasms that go into multi-dimensions. I mean, we can get really far out there. <laughs> so like, I can go really super woo when I start talking about some of those kinds of orgasms. So it can also be a tool for leaving our body in not a dissociative way, but in a way of like having out of body experience Mm -hmm. and having those oneness types of experiences. So I can go on and on about the benefits of pleasure and all the things it's brought me in my life, you know, and, and just what I've seen it bring other people when they start to really drop in and stop the rat race and like running, 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 but actually take a breath. And, and, and just what's coming back up for me is we have to get back to that. And people may say it's cliche, but that really embracing and love of self first and foremost to even give ourselves permission Mm -hmm. to enjoy, do things that we love doing rather than do things that we think society tells us that we have to do, you know, and really understanding that oxytocin and all of these pleasure chemicals and joy chemicals and they actually are so healing and nurturing for your body. And we're meant to, to have those moments every day of rest and pleasure and play and creativity, because that's literally releasing healing chemistry into our bodies. Mm-hmm. And also our immune system. There were studies done on people taking less sick days, the more orgasms they had. I don't know how they did some of these studies, but one was like <laughs> men who were experiencing orgasm daily had less risk of death. I'm like, well, like who died? Like how did they measure who died? But I actually worked with a doctor and he said, you know, it's really interesting. My cancer patients who keep having sex, they recover. And he wanted to do a whole study on this. Wow. And he was like, but my patients who aren't having sex, who stop having sex, they tend to get sicker. Um, and he's like, what's going on? Cause he was trying to understand. He was asking me about it. And I was like, I don't know. That would be a really good study though of like, how does staying sexually active even through an illness boost the immune system and what's happening there? Yeah. And so, you know, we need more studies, of course, in sexuality. It often is taboo even to study it. So we yeah, need just, more, but yeah. Oh, that's so, so good. It's so hard if you're, if you're going through treatment or something that's debilitating and so hard to, to feel sexy, so hard to feel sexy, so hard to feel sexy. So, you know, again, this isn't to say on anybody, like you're doing it wrong. Yeah, no. Or there's a bright way, like have, if you're like, frick, I'm not having any kind of sex. (laughs) And I don't, when I'm talking about sex, we need to expand it. Right. Not just intercourse. Yeah. What would bring you pleasure? Is it someone just like stroking your hair connection or your cheek or, you know, kissing your back. Yeah. What would bring you pleasure? Right. Exactly. And I love that because it doesn't always need to be about that penetration. You know, Mm -hmm. there's intimacy will release those same chemicals and um, such. Yeah. That's an important study. Yeah, I I got, I got unresourced last week and I was like, oh my gosh, I need somebody to resource me. And so my lover, like we started at seven 30 at night, he gave me a three hour touch session, like amazing pleasure. And then he like carried me off to the bed. We got in a hot tub. We got in a steam sauna. He carried me to bed. He fed me. And then he gave me more pleasure until like three in the morning. We slept a little and then we woke up and did more. Like we went until like the afternoon, like then I feel great, (laughs) you know, and then I could go serve and I can like do all the things that I do because I had that night into the next day of just being pampered and pleasured. Wow. 
That's amazing. I, I like that. That's, that's the relationship we should all strive for, <laughs> but it's just knowing it's becoming aware that when you are, as you say, unresourced, when you're completely depleted and then to, you know, to communicate with your loved ones or your lover, uh, that you need some resourcing that you need to fill your tank and that, you know, pleasure is a part of that. It's so beautiful. Thank you for sharing. And to have a voice to be bossy. You know, I think a lot of us are afraid like me to go, Nope, that's too much. Yep, over here. Oh, get that, you know, get the massager out. Or, oh, now I need a grape, you know. <laughs> a frozen <laughs> between grape. my toes. Faster, more, you know, like I I just say everything I need. Yeah, that's great. That's, yeah, you're, you're teaching me how to do that, which in life, I mean, it's a parallel to, you know, intimacy in life. It's using your voice and, and really communicating and having, um, feeling worth it enough to communicate your feelings and your needs to the people you're interacting with. So mm -hmm. that's, I mean, just and they, that. And many of them love to serve. They love it when I do that, you know, cause now they know exactly what I want exactly, you know, and, and then we can play. And sometimes I shut up and just be quiet for a few hours. <laughs> <laughs> oh, great. Um, so tell us a little bit about what kind of the programs you offer and, and where people can find you. Yeah. So people take the quiz, like just go, that's like first step, find out where your blueprint is. And I'm sure Kelly will provide links for yeah. all that. And then, um, and then there's, we have an erotic blueprint breakthrough course. So if you want to go deeper, we do have an online course that anybody can take. And then we also have around 250 coaches now that we've trained. So sometimes people want to go the coaching route and like really learn how to coach and, and sometimes not, but it just helps you learn when you're learning it for someone else. It helps you learn it deeper. So it's another deeper way to learn it. Um, so those are the main things and we do events, but right now, because of all the COVID stuff, we haven't been doing live events, but we will be doing events again someday, but we have big, large events. Sometimes it's like a thousand people was our last one. Oh wow! And then, um, and then we have smaller retreats of about 20 people that we do. So we have these different events throughout the year as well as I do do private coaching with select clients. Nice. Thank you. Um, yeah. So all the links um, to your website and, and everything will be in the show notes, but um, thank you so much for doing the work that you do, because I do believe that it is a vital piece to, you know, personal freedom and growth and uh, just honored that you were here to share your wisdom and, and pleasure on, uh, on the heel podcast. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kelly, for having the conversation and your vulnerability and for having me. It's really important we have this conversation. Thank you for listening to The Heal Podcast. Be sure to tune in for more empowering wisdom and inspiring healing stories. Oh, and make sure you hit the follow button on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss that one episode that holds the answer you've been searching for. And if you feel inspired, we would love you to rate and review us so that we have the opportunity to reach more people. And of course, you can follow us on Instagram for some behind the scenes fun and more inspiration at at Heal Documentary and at Kelly Gorris. Thank you so much and be well.